Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Reef. Today, I am joined by Corey Treadwell, based out of Germany, aka Coral Head. And Corey is uh, the head of livestock at White Corals, which is one of the bigger coral farms in Germany. They have some amazing stuff. I would say uh, white corals would not be the best way to describe the colors of the corals that they farm there. And Corey is also involved in some of the product development with NIOS, which is a great company as well. So we, uh, we went through a lot of different stuff. Corey is definitely a very passionate hobbyist and um, I find that when I chat with him, he's always got a million things to say about everything. So I bet this conversation could have gone on a lot longer than it did, but I think we covered a lot of ground. If you haven't already, I'm gonna ask that you hit subscribe on any of our channels or platforms. That really helps us as well. One of the best things you can do is share our episodes in social media with other people in the hobby. At the very least, hit that like button, maybe leave us a comment, let us know what you think. And if you really wanna support us, because we are trying to keep this podcast as free of ads or any commercial content, you can send us a PayPal at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com, or you can also sign up for monthly payments to our Patreon. Just think of it as like you're buying me a beer or a coffee or lunch or something. You can sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash beyondthereefpodcast. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Corey, AKA Coralhead. Thanks for uh, making the time to chat. We've kind of been talking a little bit over the past six months and, uh, you know, I feel like you're a very curious and passionate uh, coral reef keeper, so we can really dig into a lot of stuff you've been you've been up to. But uh, maybe just t as a start point, just tell me how you kind of got into the hobby and kind of how you got to where you are now. Uh, basically, I just fumbled into the uh, industry. I started working in a glorified Petco, basically, of Europe, mm -hmm. um, was mostly uh, into terrarium snakes, spiders, stuff like that. Um, but one of my coworkers, he got promoted, so um, they needed somebody for the saltwater uh, area. And then they just asked me, and that's basically how I dropped into the industry. I never had anything to do with saltwater before I started working. Mm. How many years um, ago was that? 13 years ago, basically. Okay, yeah. So yes. you got some, some some years in the hobby, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and from there, um, I grew the saltwater department pretty fast, pretty uh, for a, a Petco style um, store. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. And I always like got more into the more designer uh, type of animals, like jawbreakers, bounce mushrooms, um, and at some point. Um, yeah, I changed jobs and it switched very rapidly from there. Um, I switched to Fauna Marin. I think you're mm -hmm. pretty familiar with Fauna yeah, Marin. Of course. Um, and became their store manager, basically. There. Okay, cool. So um, I guess like it's kind of funny. I was just thinking about this Petco type store where you've like gotten super into getting their saltwater section going really good. And was it kind of like almost too good for that kind of store where people would come it in and really be like, was. what the heck um, is this doing here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's how um, Claude got um, wind of me mm -hmm. because I was so well known for being a Petco style store with that saltwater selection. Um, yeah, it was yeah. it was a wild ride there. Probably only a matter of time until somebody uh, picked you up and <laughs> put you into a more, I guess, more professional situation. Not that yeah. that's not professional. It's just it's a little more like uh, a little more of a I don't know family pet store than. Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't have a lot of SPS customers yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, so take me to kind of present day. You said you're doing some product development for NIOS, and then you're working at the farm at White Corals as well. Correct. Um, one and a half years, I switched jobs. Um, my job title would probably be store manager slash uh, head of livestock. Okay. Um, but everybody just calls me the coral head. That's why it's my uh, Instagram yeah. tag. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I uh, do mostly at White Corals uh, the farm. So I, when I started, the farm was already running, but it wasn't running like in production, basically. It was just running. And um, so I took that to the next level now. Um, and everything else, imports, um, ordering corals, unpacking corals, shipping corals, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and for NIOS, I do a lot of the product development Okay, well, we'll break that up into two two conversations. So on the, yeah. the the side of the white corals, like obviously you guys are a pretty big uh, um, coral farm in in Europe and mm -hmm. um, based out of Germany, obviously, right? That's where you are. Yeah, uh, correct. Should we, we didn't we didn't say that yet, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it'll be in the intro. Uh, so you said when they brought you on, the farm was kind of set up, but you, they weren't really fully culturing acro or corals yeah. yet. It was kind of like uh, yeah, they you know, were, but it was. A big hodgepodge of everything, a lot of super slow growing corals, corals that don't get sold a lot. So it wasn't really running um, profit wise. Mm -hmm. It was running for growing corals, but it wasn't running to bring money into the company. <laughs> yeah, basically. that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I started switching, buying from a lot of uh, other vendors to high end pieces, trying to get my hands on everything that. Um, basically is more high end i would say yeah and growable um, and, i guess farmable yeah and too. growable of course yeah. yeah 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 and it looks like uh sort of looking at the background i mean we'll get into some of the equipment and stuff you use but i guess uh you guys are using radions it looks like as your main lights i see quite yeah a few we're radions. heavy into ecotech i think yeah we're over 200 radions in the whole store oh. and i think around <laughs> 180 mp40 something wow. like that wow wow yeah okay. yeah well i mean they're solid pieces of equipment that's for sure they truly are and yeah yeah and also i mean a part of it is uh, i mean i would say they're sort of industry standard pieces of equipment although i feel like that could shift because they're getting so freaking expensive now um but one of the things that you can sort of say is like these were grown under radions here's our yeah. lighting schedule you know here's Correct. the kind of flow we use like you know so it's it's um repl replicatable by the end user which is nice mm -hmm. yeah i've been dabbling into uh the ati stratton pros mm -hmm. i've had uh, got one of the flex variants and the pro um, i'm kind of happy with those yeah. they have a nice spread and uh, corals seem to adapt to them as well yeah i have a couple of the original stratons and uh uh, I do really like them. I do find that, like, if I was to be utilizing them to their maximum potential, the tank would be very white, like, almost, mm -hmm. like, too white. <laughs> but, I mean, you can even dial those whites back in the par. is so even and, and nicely, you know, distributed anyways that, you know, I think they're a pretty good light. I can only imagine the new ones are even better. Yeah, I, I, they, they tweak the, the spectrum a lot. They don't yeah. have as much as the green cyan colors, which yeah. tend to more be to the white. Um, they have uh, a lot more into the UVs, which I like a lot. Yeah, I just remember putting on one of the SPS uh, presets and it was like the whitest, like bright. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> all my corals were just like did not look that good. I mean, I should be able to say that they look good under white, 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 white lighting like that. But it was just not not something I would have wanted. <laughs> but. but then again, in Europe, we don't use heavy blues that much. Yeah. It's been coming in for the last couple of years, but it's not as heavy as uh, in the States or in Canada. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that makes sense. I think part of it for me is like, I like the whole spectrum over the course of the day. So it's like, you know, I enjoy looking at the corals under the blue spectrum and then we get into the afternoon and it's it hits its white kind of period. Okay. And, you know, my white period might not be as white as your white period. I assume, are you guys using uh, pros or, or you're probably using Yeah, pros. completely pros. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mostly fours and fives. Yeah. And how many, so uh, as far as the systems there, like how many separate systems, how many like liters or gallons of, of total systems would you say? So the farm has four systems, two main systems, which have uh, each 4, 000, about 5,000 liters. Mm -hmm. um, one ZOA system, which has about 1,500 liters and a quarantine, which has another 1,500 liters. Okay. Then we have the retail store, which has three and a half, four and a half, two, two and a half. And then the 
online store. Basically, we have another section for the online store, which has another, I would say, 5,000 liters. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of water overall, plus yeah. the fish systems and invert systems, which are another 8,000 something liters. So I'm kind of curious about the difference between some of the systems, and I'm sure you you probably are able to learn from what is done differently between some of them, and you know some of them mm -hmm. you get to experiment a bit more. But I'm assuming that there's probably some systems that are more for your broodstock mother colonies, and then some are going to be more for your frags and grow out. Like like you said, there's a web store system. Mm -hmm. Like, do you actually keep mother colonies in there, or is that no? Yeah. Uh, the the web store is basically only everything that is we have three updates every week we go about 700 ish what you see is what you get corals wow, every week that's a lot um so <laughs> yeah that's why we need a lot of room for yeah. and we don't only sell frags we sell a lot of uh, big colonies from australia and indo so we need that space for our online store um the farm we have in three sections basically um the first section which is about three and a half meters long by a meter 50 wide um, is mother colonies on both sides, LPS and SPS. Mm -hmm. And then the rest, um, which is all the, uh, the whole tank is 10 meters. So another six and a half meters, just frags. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of frags. Cause I, I mean, <laughs> if you're, if you're updating 700 whizzy wigs a week, that's a, uh, that's a lot of volume yeah. moving. Yeah. But uh, I mean, at the same time, seeing that kind of volume come through, you get to see a lot of, coral coming in and i'm sure oh, yeah. like it must be kind of cool to be able to see that kind of volume and to cherry pick and kind of set aside things that you know are like okay this is a keeper <laughs> um <laughs> yeah it's always like christmas for me we get about one shipment every week sometimes even two shipments mm -hmm. um last was from tonga um that was really nice i haven't had that in years um seeing some really nice uh, yellow uh, leathers since we can't get fiji for some reason we oh, still okay. can't get it yeah. um that that's uh, how we got some nice uh, yellow uh, leathers that was something special for me yeah yeah i guess tonga is kind of along that same kind of like pacific yeah. kind of island chain yeah yeah, that would make sense. Um, anything else from Tonga? I mean, I remember getting Tonga years ago, and I don't want to, I don't want to bash any country's <laughs> export of corals, but it was, it was not a good shipment. Oh no, um, it was a disaster overall. Yeah, it was yeah. <laughs> the shipment itself was a disaster. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cheaper, um, but then at the end of the day, like the majority of what you end up paying for is weight, anyways. So, uh, you know, I mean, if, yeah, but you, you, I'm sure as long as you got some nice stuff and made it worthwhile. Yeah, I think yeah. overall the 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 time, how long it was shipped, that was. Was the biggest issue yeah um but what we managed to to save was really nice yeah okay yeah and i think isn't don't those button scolies come from tonga i think that's no they come from western australia okay i think i thought I we get a lot somewhere. of uh, yeah. button scolies from western australia yeah okay cool yeah yeah so what i mean what would you say as far as like your favorite region for where you've seen coral coming out of hmm <sighs> I mean, there's a little like something the most... from everywhere, right? But yeah, uh... <laughs> true. But I'm I've been really enjoying Western Australia lately. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of um, nice button scolies, and they don't stay button. If you ever kept them, they get about the size of a, a normal scoli if you mm -hmm. really keep them for a while. Um, but I've been enjoying the alveopora that we're getting from mm -hmm. Western Australia. Um, nice pinks and uh, yellow rimmed versions and they grow really well for in the farm as well. Yeah. That's why I've been enjoying Western Australia a lot. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot of really nice LPS coming from there. I remember seeing a little little setup at Aquashella. Uh, that was uh, just some really mind-blowing stuff. I mean, it was like everything in that tank I wanted. So, <laughs> yeah. The problem is with Australia, though, is that we Europeans, we can't import a lot of corals. We can't get euphilia. We can't get ca uh, um, catalophilia. We mm -hmm. can't get duncans. We can't get a lot of cool corals from Australia anymore. Yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe some of those species are going to be a little cheaper and you're going to get good ones from Indo anyways. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as far as the price point, it's probably just, you know, I'm pretty happy with Euphelia from, from Indo, so. True. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do recall Australian price lists for things like gold torches to be like, seriously, that much for one polyp? Like, are you yeah, I think that? like gold torches <laughs> were like $100 per head or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's wild. Totally wild. But um, who knows? I don't know why why things uh, are that way. It could be the limitation of how much they can collect and, and stuff like that. But uh, I'm going to have Australian guests on soon. So I'll. I heard uh, Monsoon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, good people. Yeah, good so people. that should be fun. 
Yeah. So, okay. I want to talk a little bit more about the differences between the systems. Like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as your ability to experiment and sort of influence how these systems are run, is there anything like really specific you've tried on say two sets of water chemistry or, um, you know, something else to do with the methodology of a system? Maybe, Maybe it's the way the major elements are supplied anything that you've done specific and sort of noticed like some good, uh, taking some good information from? So I've always been a big ICP uh, proponent. Um, I've, I was there when it started with Triton. I was back uh, when he ha- still had his store, basically. I visited him back then because everybody was saying, oh, ICP, that can't work for saltwater aquarium. So I mm. went there firsthand to see how it works. Um, and ever since, I've been a huge, huge fan of ICPs. And you can clearly see how different um, systems work that are mainly like LPS systems or mainly SPS systems. Mm -hmm. For LPS systems, you see they have a huge um, demand in uh, vanadium for some reason, probably like the huge amount of flesh that those corals have. Mm. They just suck it up. It's gone instantly. Or when um, you have a tank that is mainly uh, Montipora, and you dose a little bit of zinc, they they just start to shine a lot more. It's mm. just those mm. tiny things that when you have a lot of different systems that are dedicated to a lot of different um, genotypes of corals, basically, yeah. Yeah. you can see those uh, subtle changes. Yeah, and you kind of end up seeing certain certain trace, minor trace being consumed a lot faster. Probably certain major traces too. I imagine things mm-hmm. like strontium get used in between different coral systems at different rates too. Yeah, um, I was surprised to see how much the LPS system basically uh, pulls in uh, strontium. I, I didn't expect that to see it, but mm. it is, um, I would say about... 1.5 times the amount of the SPS system. So that was pretty uh, surprising mm-hmm. to me. Wow, crazy. Yeah, actually, I mean, I've had the opposite experience between my SPS and LPS system. The SPS system is always low on strontium, and mm-hmm. the LPS tends to be okay, uh, it tends to be within range. But there could be other factors. I mean, those systems are, one is running calcium reactor and calc. That's the LPS system. And the SPS system mm-hmm. has got a whole bunch of different methods going on. Yeah. <laughs> probably too much. But uh, but for whatever reason, it seems to sustain that other system. So I don't know why. But uh, so as far as major element supply, what do you prefer? What are you kind of using so, on most of the systems? Uh, for the SPS system, sorry, um, right now we're using uh, soda ash. So carbonate, uh, sodium carbonate. Just soda uh, ash. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, and for the calcium, it's calcium um, uh, chloride. Chloride, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. And and is this? Are you adding any trace to this, or is that done separately? Yeah. Um, yeah. We added uh, the traces directly into the uh, both um, solutions. We have we mixed it ourselves. We found which works best for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on how the ICP is, uh, the next time we just add a little bit more of the trace solution for the uh, elk or a little bit more of the trace solution for the yeah. calcium. Yeah, so you've kind of made your own, uh, essentially like Fauna Marine has its trace one, two, three. Yeah, you've very similar. I mean, I yeah. I worked at Fauna for so long yeah. and I saw how well this system works. Um, so I thought to myself, if not this, then how would I do it? Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, this is the best way to provide trace elements because how often does it happen that calcium starts, uh, you don't need to dose as much for some reason, the coral stop growing. And if you have uh, your trace elements on a different um, dosing line yeah. and it starts and continues to dose, then your trace elements go out of whack. But if you have it yeah. in your calcium solution and you stop dosing calcium, also the uh, trace elements don't Yeah, get and that also kind of saves, you know, versus, say, the Reef Moonshiners method where you're adding that stuff every day manually. It's like it's getting added with the calcium dosing anyways. I like the way that they think, but um, I would rather have a constant for I would say 90% of my trace elements and then the last I sometimes tweak but mm-hmm. um, every single one every day would not be feasible for a farm oh for sure that, yeah yeah I think you know what you're saying is it's like you get your base level point where you kind of have you know a stable 
you know, supply of those elements. And then you can see from your ICPs if you need to adjust slightly from there. But at least it's it's constantly getting into the system, right? Correct. You always have a good baseline, so you never get depleted on anything. That's uh, what I uh, strive for. Yeah, yeah. And now, actually, speaking of that, I just I had the idea when I made my last batch of calcium up. Uh, there's a few elements for me that are always low, like zinc, nickel, uh, chrome, Typical, yeah. usually cobalt. Uh, and iron. Those would be, mm -hmm. sometimes copper is a little low too, but I'd rather do that manually than than add it to my trace mixture. But what I ended up doing is I, I'd still use the Fauna 123 with my with my bowling like mm -hmm. solutions, but I just did some adjustments to the calcium one. So I just added Yeah, sure. Those, you can just you know, add a little bit of yeah, zinc in it. Like you're not, like if you think about the daily consumption that actually by the time I get an ICP and it's like, oh, I got to add 40 mils of cr chromium to my system it's like i might as well just put um you know a little less than that but you know make a bit of an estimation of how much the system uses and add that to the right ionic mixture so obviously the ones yeah. that need to go with alkalinity go with alkalinity and the ones that go with calcium go with that. yeah sometimes yeah. and you can't mix all of them together that's uh, i had to learn that the oh, hard sure. way when we when we tried uh, getting our mixture right some elements just don't mix together or at certain levels they just start to precipitate out so mm -hmm. um you can't mix everything in one solution yeah so speaking of like you know some of these minor trace have you noticed at any point any of the trace getting above the recommended levels and noticing any positive results from this i'm always curious about this if people have pushed the limits a little bit I mean, I've pushed a lot of limits over the years. Um, right now, I'm uh, heavily into uh, nickel. Mm -hmm. I'm running it between five and eight-ish um, right now. And I'm seeing good results from it. I'm not doing it at the farm. I'm just doing it in one show tank just to see if I want to mm -hmm. try it out at the mm -hmm. farm. Um, and so far, the corals have been responding uh, fairly well. I've You never know what they really do, but I've read a lot that it helps... Um, base growth of mm -hmm. Acropora, and it does seem to help. I mean, a lot of Acroporas, they've been growing bases. I've never seen, they basically look like they're trying to uh, engulf the whole rock, basically. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I feel like corals, you know, there's probably these genetic, these genes that turn on and off when they're a small frag, and there's something, some sense of, you know, putting down a foundation, but I think maybe there's a gene that must turn off when it's like, okay, mm -hmm. we got enough base structure. But, you know, yeah. maybe some of these trace elements are sort of triggering some of these genes to, you know, you know, reactivate or, you know, there's some kind of information going on that's telling the coral, OK, let's put down more base. I don't know. I mean, it's hard, yeah. hard to say. No, right? that's yeah. exactly what I think. And um, it seems to, to work fairly well. I used to do a lot of zinc. Mm -hmm. um, I was running it between five and ten ish. But that was super hard to do because to raise it by one point, I had to basically dose five points every day, which was not feasible for me anymore. So I just let it run somewhere between two uh, and five-ish. Okay. Yeah. I should actually pull up my ICP and compare to that. But uh, Are, uh, How do yeah. you measure yours? Uh, with ICP MS or OES? Well, I mean, I did, I've done the MS and the OES. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, generally, it's OES that's, I'm mean, usually using the Fauna. Um, mm -hmm. ICP. Good test. Yeah. Solid and, test. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's in their future to start offering MS as well. Um, as far okay. as I know, they actually do have MS machines, but it's just not part of their laboratory testing yet so i mean it, you know. what i could tell from talking to um christo from osiamo it's mm -hmm. really complicated to get it right mm -hmm. um, because there's so many more steps and um like overall like the hygiene even like a small hair uh, follicle could <laughs> yeah. change everything totally. so that's a big hurdle to get that right that's what I, he told me basically yeah okay yeah so i'm just looking at this last icp and it's interesting because you said you yeah you experimented with putting zinc up in the how much range uh, five to ten ish five to ten after yeah after ten then I started seeing recession okay so I wouldn't go over ten interesting micrograms yeah yeah because yeah the ma the test range says one to three on the Oshiamo one so yeah uh, yeah so you're definitely pushing that limit and then the other one was nickel his says two to five so you yeah went I'm five at to two, ten five to eight somewhere yeah, in, five to in eight that. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it's probably there's probably a little more to it as well as far as like if you're going to elevate some of these elements, which I don't recommend people really experiment with unless you have, 
you know, the kind of conditions in laboratory to kind of really, really see what happens. But I think there's a balance between obviously all these elements too. So you can't yeah. just try elevating one. You should probably be thinking about the relationship yeah, between them. Yeah, everything else should already be in a good, good amount yeah. before you start just tweaking one of them. Sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And if, if you want to tweak it, I would uh, recommend to go super slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, anything else between the systems you've kind of experimented with, like as far as lighting or any products dosed, anything like that? Um, well, I'm a huge fan of uh, feeding my corals. Mm -hmm. So um, to see how the LPS systems and the uh, acro systems react to it is very interesting. Um, I've been dabbling with a lot of fatty acids lately. Um, and for the LPS systems, you basically just see them getting super puffy, really big. Um, so if you have like a scoli, it like triples in size. <laughs> wow. But for the SBS, they get the white, um, uh, the white string, what is it called? Yeah, the, yes, yeah, correct. You filaments. see them extremely long, very similar to, um, what the concoction, what mm -hmm. in the States is now everybody doing very similar to reaction. If you dose, um, fatty acids okay so are fatty acids are aminos right like are we kind of talking about yeah no 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 not aminos or, or can you no, kind of no, elaborate no. on on what you mean by fatty acids then um omega-3 fatty acids uh, mm -hmm. is a very uh, easy one like um you get it with fish oils mm -hmm. um some uh, i use uh, uh phytoplankton a mm -hmm. very um, a type of phytoplankton that you can't you don't see in the aquarium uh products basically um aminos i dose a lot of aminos as well hmm. um i came up with a mixture for nios um with the, the team over at nios um it leans very heavily in the polyp um promotion basically mm -hmm. um i've been enjoying that a lot um, I don't see a lot of nitrates rising, which um, I see a lot of people co complaining about when dosing um, aminos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's been some discussion about how aminos that don't get utilized just kind of convert into nitrates, but they could also potentially feed some of your bad bacteria strains. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I've been aminos off for probably the past few years. There's been a couple times I brought them back on and not really seen a ton of benefit to my system but i mean i mean you would probably know pretty well like these aminos are not all created equal it's really a blend of amino acids right there's a whole list Correct. of yeah some of them promote <clears throat> cyanos really fast i've seen that with some products when you dose a few times a little bit too much um you get cyanos i mean that's not a secret yeah um i've been working with a lot of sugars lately I love, I've uh, been dabbling into that, um, reading a lot of papers because um, some sugars seem to promote the microbiome really well, hmm. what, what I've read. And I've seen uh, a lot of improvements with aquaporic color, even though my uh, nitrates and phosphates are pretty high in one of the show tanks, the coloration is um, like I ha would have super low nutrients. Um, one of the papers um, says basically that um, having those sugars in the water blocks the zooxanthellae from producing more because the coral thinks it has enough sugar. Mm. So that's why it gets uh, they, it reduces the amount of zooxanthellae. Yeah. So that's what I've been working with a lot lately. So these sugars are these like simple type sugars or more of a complex kind of version of a of a sugar source. A broad spectrum. Um, a few of the uh, more uh, short chain, uh, simple ch sugars, but a few alcohol sugars. I've been mm. uh, working with alcohol sugars, which um, I haven't seen a lot of people working with yet. Um, I haven't been too much in those uh, marine polymers, basically like um, mm. some uh, algae, which is some of the algae. I haven't worked with those too much. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm sort of, you got me thinking about that sugars thing in the coral potentially not taking in as much of the zooxanthellae. Like, I kind of thought because the polyp, the mouth of the polyp has this green fluorescent protein that attracts the zooxanthellae into it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if, 
because it's I feel like that's going to happen no matter what, right? Sure. Like, would yeah, it but just it, be happening? But maybe the coral rejects the coral some can of it. regulate up and down how yeah. much zooxanthellae it needs, yeah. um, and it regulates that by how much sugar it basically 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 needs. Mm -hmm. And if there's enough sugar in the water, I suspect it can downregulate that. Yeah, and I think we can see that expressed by like we've all seen like our torch or euphelia torch corals like kind of eject those those strands of zooxanthellae. Yeah. Before we see that a lot with yeah. um, larger LPS like yeah. uh, trachophilia yeah. too. People say like, oh, this it's pooping or whatever. It's like, no, it's actually that's just expelling the zooxanthellae. As far as what yeah. I understand, that's kind of what we're true. Yeah, uh, I, I get a lot of customers who ask me that question: Why is that happening? Mm -hmm. And usually, it happens right before uh, the light goes more into the blue dimmer, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, which yeah. indicates that it's just light stress. Um, and when a coral has too much light, um, it expels zooxanthellae. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of taken in more than it than it needs, and probably yeah. it's, it has to do with that um, maximum photosynthesis period too, where it's kind of, you know, that's that's the max that, <laughs> yeah, the, nature's intended for really in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So anything else as far as products uh, you've sort of seen good results with? Like, I, I mean. You know, you probably agree there's a lot of products on the market that are kind of just marketing and like, you know, they may do some some good things, but that might just be a blend of trace elements or something where there's an easier and cheaper way to do it. Is there anything that you'd say is like a little bit more of a magic potion? A magic potion? Yeah. I'm not sure if I would call... I've been enjoying bacteria dosing. It's been like in everybody's mouth lately. But I've been enjoying um, a lot of the bacteria products on the market. I've been testing around, which work, uh, and especially those clean bacteria products that um, waste away and mm -hmm. those types. I've been really liking those. Um, I tested how much they really t uh, like remove the tritis and tried to find out why and which bacteria do it. Mm -hmm. And the science does back it and the tanks look phenomenal after dosing uh, water much clearer um, much less sludge around the tanks um, I've been really really enjoying bacteria so thinking. so these yeah I, I know about these kind of products and I haven't used them any time recently but is it is the kind of the concept in a way that the detritus is more um, put into a form that allows it to be skimmed out as a, because it's obviously that that particulate that makes up the detritus is still being created. It's still fish poop and whatever else. So where, what's actually yeah, but happening? It, <laughs> it's very often like cellulose, um, like which is the rest, and not a lot of bacteria can um, or chitin, um, and not a lot of bacteria can break that down. And the, uh, those bacteria and these specific products are able to break down chitin and cellulose mm -hmm. and then have it back in the water column to be skimmed out. So that's why you ha usually have those little piles because nobody can make use of it. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. So this, these bacteria strains do basically make use of it. They make it. Yeah. 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 So which is a good one? What would you point people towards? I mean, I guess if you're doing stuff with NIOS, then there's probably... <laughs> yeah, we're we're working on something. Yeah. Um, but right now on the market, uh, Dr. Tim's Waste Away is yeah. a really good product, I would okay. say. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I'm I'm uh, curious to see. I mean, sort of speaking about bacteria, uh, I'm curious to see what this Vibex from Fauna Marine is going to be like as far as a solution. Also, very very interesting bacteria. Um, they come from more of the aquaculture side of the, um, so not our hobby, but mm -hmm. more like fish and shrimp breeding. Mm -hmm. um, and they help to um, reduce the amount of Vibrio and other pathogens. Um, I'm also playing a lot with that uh, for NIOS. And um, it seems very um, plausible that it works in our hobby as well. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about it. We have in Europe a big um, problem with bacteria infections right now. And as Europeans, we, d we don't get that easily um, antibiotics. Yeah. So we have to find a way around. That's why Claude came up with Vibix. Um, and I think that's uh, a very good way to go for us.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've learned that from a few guests uh, from Europe here is that your access to antibiotics, it's it's not like the trailer park antibiotics in the States. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's like, very, very limited. Yeah. Let's say that. <laughs> yeah. So they seem to be able to get it more easily there. And I think, yeah, I do think that the subject is often talked about a little too lightly. And, and you know, but like you say, there are bacterial issues like we know. Um, you know, like I think a lot of the time, like a lot of the weird stuff going on in our systems is going to come down to the microbiome and probably your trace elements and ratios of those trace elements. True. It's things like that. I mean, assuming your all your major parameters are stable and you have yeah. a decent pH and flow and lighting and all that stuff. I mean, if you're a fairly advanced hobbyist, it's going to, those minute little things are going to come down to those aspects, you know, so... Um, but yeah, so wh where do you kind of see, I mean, I, I, I like that approach of looking at like solutions for improving the microbiome versus this, you know, blowtorch to the system reset kind of button. So any other kind of thoughts on like where that's kind of going? I think we definitely have to go more specific on saltwater strains. Right now we're mm -hmm. just grabbing what we can. But I think in the near future, we'll have more and more companies go more specific into saltwater strains that mm -hmm. are, have found to fight off uh, pathogens. That's yeah. where I think it's good. Well, it'll be interesting to see, uh, like, Acrobiomics is going to get more and more data. And, yeah. you know, that will be a really good asset to the hobby as it gets more, um, yeah, I guess a little more... I mean, I would say it's still fairly new. So, like, if you compare the reef hobby to those commercial applications, you know, there's, you know, millions and millions of dollars that have gone into a lot of this development. So, yeah. I mean, it is good to borrow from that industry. There's no question, yeah. right? I and mean, it works for us. Yeah. Does it work in the long run? Do we know what we're, because we're dumping in different freshwater or saltwater strains but not um, marine strains mm -hmm. what they do in the long run no we don't right now but through aquabiomics i think we we will see what happens yeah well i wonder if i mean even some of those strains probably don't actually survive in a saltwater system very long no I, I don't I mean, think so bacteria, i think many of them yeah. have a very short uh, half-life in a tank yeah and maybe that's not a bad thing maybe some of those strains are more like a coral food like maybe they yeah. end up you know getting utilized in that way versus uh yeah i mean it's hard to say everything you put in for everything you add there's some inverse <laughs> you know reaction right there's 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 something's gonna happen so yeah Cool. Yeah. Well. Um. Yeah. Bacteria. That's. Uh. It's. It seems to be the the hottest topic of the last couple of years. Uh, right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the whole trace elements uh, is so open, so transparent now. So we yeah. have to find something else. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Versus the old blue bottles. Hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, let's talk about some of the stuff you're doing with NIO. So you're kind of doing some product development. You were telling me about, I mean, we can talk about pests and dipping and protocols for that. But uh, you said you were kind of developing a new new dip or, or potentially like, wasn't it even an in-tank um, treatment? <laughs> Yeah, those are two different things, but okay. uh, let's well, let's start with the with the dip. Basically, since I work for white corals, I get so many coral shipments every week. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have seen. I think I've seen every pest you can, you can imagine. Yeah. Um. So I've tried every dip you could imagine. Um. And I wasn't really happy with all of them. Um. Some are better than others. Um. Yeah, and some are better for different things too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought to myself, I mean, I have a company behind me, so why not start developing our own uh, blend? And I came up with a blend of different oils, which have all different types of um, things that they affect. And I've seen tremendous, um, sorry, I have to pat myself on the back a little <laughs> <Yeah>. bit, um, <laughs> tremendous effect um, on, on pests I've I, uh, I really, really enjoy that dip. We uh, um, just showed it off at Interzoo this cool. uh, last yeah. uh, two weeks ago. So it should be available pretty soon. Um, it even works on white bugs and black bugs. Um, I think I've sh shown you a yeah. few yeah. pictures of that. Yeah. Um, flatworms die in seconds. Um, Montipora nudies just fall off. Th those are a bit more on the harder side yeah. to kill. Yeah, they are um, a little hardier in dips, from yeah. what I recall. Yeah. Um, but they fall off uh, after the 10 minutes. Um, I haven't seen a pest that gets through. 
Yeah. So and, far. And what about? I mean, my my big question is how how gentle is it on coral? That tissue? is always a big question. I mean, <laughs> you can have the operation work, but the uh, patient is dead. Yeah, um, everything no. came off. Even the yeah. coral tissue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's actually uh, pretty, pretty uh, astonishing. And, um, acros have their polyps out when it's in the dip, basically. Mm, okay. um, you can really tell that it's breathing like um, in the dip. Mm -hmm. I added um, uh, vitamins into the dip as well. So um, it's, um, I wouldn't say smoothing to the skin but it, you can tell that the coral is uh, enjoying being in the dip you don't mm -hmm. see a lot of sliming like you typical see uh, see with the uh, potassium based dips you see mm -hmm. like huge slimes you don't get that with uh, that okay. oil based dips interesting so and i mean i think uh like dips like revive and coral rx they're kind of an oil base as well correct right? yeah. but um mm -hmm. maybe you said this is a blend of different oils that yeah, you kind uh, of selected of... for specific reasons like Correct. You yeah. usually have dips that are based on tree, uh, tea tree oil or neem oil sometimes. Um, uh, yeah, mostly those very harsh smelling oils. Mm -hmm. um, they work fairly well, but they're harsh in the coral as well. So I looked into um, a lot of uh, papers that were specific uh, to nematodes or specific to flatworms but not mm -hmm. usually not in our hobby um some were uh, specific against bacteria so i looked at different papers and took those oils mixed them up and came up with a solution that um, is odd there's really odd oils i would say yeah how does it um, smell you, <laughs> what does it um, smell like <laughs> it smells really fresh, uh, summer-like, um, a little bit of a lemon uh, <laughs> smell to it. Nice. When I give it to people, they just want to take a sip of it. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I have to write on it, don't drink it. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, it's, I think it's going to be uh, a great um, product for reefers and um, the companies as well who cool. dip a lot of coffee. So this will be a NIOS product? Yes. Yeah. This okay. will be a nice. Do you, do you, does it have a name yet, or is it uh, still? No, we're still there? on the fence on how we're going to call it because mm. we're NIOS is completely revamping all of their products. Yeah. Um, we started showing it off. We'll have um, a new two part, which is basically a three part. Um, so what we did is we managed to take the original balling, which is the three part, mm -hmm. and we took the um, sodium free salt and split it and put it into um, the alkalinity and the calcium. So you have a ionically balanced salt in two, basically. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll have trace elements that you put into calcium and uh, um, alkalinity as well. We'll have different bacteria products, uh, coral foods, amino acids. Uh, I think it's going to be a great year for Niles. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a good product line from what I know about it already. I haven't used a lot of the products, but uh, yeah, and the, the equipment looks good too. I mean, the skimmer looks, I've seen the skimmer, uh, I don't know if I've seen it in person, but I researched it pretty well and it seems like a pretty awesome unit for the price. Yeah, we talked about Leo not too long ago. Yeah. He just ordered a few of the new skimmers for the his farm. Nice. Yeah, because he was really impressed with one that he had. Cool. Yeah. So um, this dip, and it's something I was going to say too was, uh, you guys would also, since you were saying you don't have access to antibiotics as accessibly as maybe we do in North America, also things like uh, milbamycin oxime, like in, uh, AKA interceptor, like you wouldn't yeah. be able to get something like that probably as easy very very either. hard through a yeah. um, through a vet and even. If you go to a vet, a lot of them just say no because they don't know anything about saltwater aquariums. So even if you know exactly what you want, they won't give mm -hmm. it to you. So um, that's another reason why I was so determined to get that dip right mm -hmm. um, so that bugs don't get through. I haven't had the chance to test it on red bugs yet, luckily for me, mm -hmm. but bad for the dip. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's really hard to... to um, kill something like that in tank for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. well, and also, like, even with dipping, um, I do find that acro bugs, like, as in copepods, like you say, the red bugs or the gray bugs or black bugs, they don't come off in all dips. And I think yeah. part of it is that, you know, they're sort of in the mucus and the in the tissue of the coral, and maybe they get some protection around the polyps. Yeah, or... they, 
sometimes they even have like a little bubble of air around themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why it's so important when you dip a coral to use a turkey baster or something to pop that open or yeah. get the dip everywhere. But they're very hardy too. Um, they can block off and get like, immu- it's not a real immune system, but they can block off taking in certain types of toxins. Yeah, That's why some of the potassium salts work on them somewhat because they can't block it off mm. because it works through hyposalinity not yeah. um through a toxin yeah well it sounds like it is a toxicity level of the potassium to them as well to a little but bit, i would yeah. imagine for a crustacean that hypersalinity would be one of the more the more yeah. reason for that, that that it would come off in that case maybe the flatworms it's the toxicity because their whole yeah. body is basically a membrane <laughs> for mm-hmm. you know but but i mean that would also be the salinity too i don't know hard to say so um tell me about this in tank treatment i'm yeah. curious uh you know where the development's at with that because this is the thing that people are going to be the most excited for if it works <laughs> oh, but it's, ugh, it's so hard to get something like that right so through the dip um one of the oils worked so well against flatworms um they disintegrate basically hmm. um so what i tried to find out why that works and i found out which main ingredient is in that type of oil um and what I did is break it down so uh, in such a small amount that it w- uh, I was able to dose it into tanks. And uh, the effect in tank is the flatworm starts to uh, like cramp it uh, together. If you see it's unwell, it moves around a lot. Maybe mm-hmm. I can send you a short video or something. Yeah, yeah, I can put it um, in. It, uh, it's just not happy. And after about 45 minutes, it just falls off the acropora and just flies away. It even works on euphelia eating flatworms. I've seen um, the leopard uh, polyclads, the big ones, they have the same effect. So it works really well on all types of flatworms. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm trying to get the dosage right because it does have an effect on shrimp too. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody could... um, yeah, everybody would take out a shrimp in an aquapora tank for it. Yeah, but I mean, people with, you know, SPS systems, especially farmers, they're kind of ready to run something like Interceptor yeah. anyways. So, you know, like, you know, potentially just keeping hermits and crustaceans and stuff out of the system is... Yeah, know. but I didn't have any issues with hermits. I yeah. didn't have any issues with um, sea urchins. It was just shrimp. And snails um, were okay? snails yeah sure. okay. yeah if you overdose it you see that they fall off but after about two hours they it's just basically paralyzes them yeah um but they get back up they just get um, a little bit I'm, stoned for a little while yeah, yeah so i'm trying to get the dosage right it's not that okay. easy because you have to mix it with um because it's an oil you mm-hmm. have to mix it with something that you can add to your tank as well yeah um, it's so got to be broken get... down to mix with your water right it's, yeah yeah exactly. so um so how will that work exactly once it's like a if it's a product that goes to market then um so far it looks like your skimmer is going to be um not working for about six hours that's what Mm. i found um but other than that after six hours your skimmer starts working again it's like a fatty food basically if Mm -hmm. you feed something cell con or something like that yeah yeah, yeah, actually, and something I, I forgot to say this when we were talking about, you were talking about uh, fatty acids and the feeding response of corals. Uh, I actually, I recently made up a new batch of like my own fish food that I feed, and mm-hmm. I put some salmon in it, and I haven't used the salmon in a while, but come to think of it, um, the feeding response from the corals when I feed this food is like way, way, way more than it used to be. Yeah. And it could come down to that fatty acid that's Omega, in the salmon. Because yeah. the salmon three, yeah. is really high in those those fatty acids, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just a little sidetrack because I wanted to mention No, no, that. but that yeah. definitely could be it. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, so I'm trying to get that done. But I, I don't want to give out a product like that until it's bulletproof. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's also just a side project for me. I mean, my yeah. main job is to keep coral... I have a coral farm to run. Yeah. Um, but still, that is uh, if you if I can get this right, uh, it would help so many people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm excited for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like you say, it's just a matter of figuring out the 
dose and the regimen, you know, potentially when do you do a water change or add carbon afterwards? Um, you know, would carbon work with something that's an oil base? I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure, but I think because it's a, a, a phenol, it's basically um, um, a plant toxin, you could say, mm -hmm. which makes it work. Um, I think carbon probably would pull it out if it yeah. gets too much. So the regimen would look like um, dose it once every week for six weeks mm -hmm. because it kills the flatworms. It, it works better on smaller flatworms um, than larger ones, but it does work on larger ones too. So I would say dose it every week for six weeks. Then you have everything gone, all the new ones that uh, that hatched gone, and I think after six weeks you should be yeah, yeah you free. break that full life cycle. I think there was a Reef Builders article about the actual life cycle of the standard acropora eating flatworm, and it was actually yeah, I like think they a, had a paperwork about yeah, that. it was a longer um, gestation period, I guess would you call that with a flatworm? Is it still a gestation period? <laughs> but it was longer <laughs> than you would have expected. The life cycle was, you know, from egg to uh, replicate, you know, like sexually. Yeah, I think um, it was like 40 days. Something yeah, like yeah, that. it was like, like around a month or so. Yeah, so um, longer than you would expect. I think that those new Acropora eating flatworms, the little purple ones. Black ones, yeah. I ones... Had, when I started at uh, White Corals, we had a lot of them. For some reason, it, they came from one farm, and those are really tough to yeah, kill. Yeah. Um, that was one of the main reasons why I came up with the new dip, because nothing was really working on them. Um, the guy who worked there before me um, basically uh, killed a shit ton of Acropora, um, Millipora, and Tenuis with um, a competitor's dip, trying yeah. to kill them, but it didn't work. He basically just killed the Acros. Yeah, and I think those have a much shorter replication cycle, and they lay eggs everywhere. Like they're way. Yeah, less. they have. They yeah. don't have the clusters. They lay them yeah. everywhere. They're super fast. Um, they're a very, very different type of flatworm. Yeah, they're not super flat. They're more like uh, oval yeah. shaped. Yeah, totally. And um. Super interesting animal. I mean, they don't work like a normal flatworm where you have one here, one there. They hunt in a group, basically, like wolves. Mm. You see at night, they group together and just eat it from the bottom up. Yeah. Super interesting, but horrible if you have yeah, them. Yeah, and way more destructive than the standard a AWEFs. Like, they... Yeah. Uh they you know they really eat the tissue whereas i feel yeah. like you know regular acropora flatworms they just take these little little nice little bites here and there yeah and, you know and if and there's like a lot over of them, time yeah over time it'll die but these things just Super mow horrible. they mow the lawn yep. for sure but uh my experience that i found was um there's a type of peppermint shrimp that eats the adults and the eggs uh, okay. It's the Quick and Thali Lismata, and they're out. Of oh yeah, Jakarta. I just ordered a, a fifty of them yeah. from uh, from Indo. Yeah. So what I discovered when I found some of these in the quarantine system is I set up a smaller system uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, about twenty five gallons, and I put about thirty of these shrimp in there. And when I saw them on the base of a coral, I just put it in that tank. So these shrimp really had nothing else to interact with other than whatever I put in there. And okay. uh, they just went straight to it. And I, I think I have a video somewhere of them just Awesome. Off then the... I'll definitely put a few in the yeah. farm too. Yeah. Just to make sure. Yeah. And then uh, I, yeah, I threw, you know, 10 or so, like once I was done with this, I just threw them in my systems and... Uh, I mean, I'm sure they're there on, as preventative yeah, you potential really maintenance, <laughs> you know, but um, they're ravenous little dudes like they they will go for whatever, you know, <laughs> like opportunistic like eaters, is, right? I like about uh, what I like about them is the size compared to a normal peppermint shrimp. They grow much larger, which um, helps them not to be eaten by a yeah, hogfish. That's or true. Like that. Yeah, a little bit better chance of defending themselves yeah. <laughs> if they have to. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I just think like a bigger animal is just a little more just hardier in general too. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is a, a question I always like to kind of throw at people: is um, is there anything in specific you attribute to fluorescence or metallic pigments in SPS? In SPS, I mean, I would say it's applicable to LPS, you know, like mm -hmm. as well, but it's a little more. But set. I know what you mean about SPS. Yeah. yeah. Um. I th really think it is zinc. 
I really, really believe that. Hmm. Over the years working with daily, I mean, I had daily ICP testing. Not, not a lot of people can, can mm-hmm. say that. Yeah, yeah, um, no. <laughs> weekly would even be pretty impressive. But. Weekly is even <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty big for, for uh, a lot of people. No, but you instantly see a difference when you dose zinc and the next day it's just a big big difference i believe having that down or at least having a good amount going in daily um will improve fluorescent in in the 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 shine on the coral Mm -hmm. a lot yeah because i mean for me that's one of the main things i'm sort of trying to to get out of my systems is that that Mm -hmm. metallic shine you know and uh and some tanks just kind of have it and and sometimes i've even seen really good you know metallic pigments in tanks where you know the owner that ran the system didn't really put any super crazy care into you know the trace elements or anything mm-hmm. but the system just presented that those pigments really well i mean a lot of trace elements are in high amounts in dry foods if you if you have a high quality dry food and you look on the label it even says like seven uh, milligrams of zinc yeah. or nickel. Yeah. And those are huge amounts. If you think about it. we're having micrograms in it and those are milligrams in them. Um, so that's why a lot of tanks run so well by just being fed. But yeah. the people are feeding good foods. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, it was actually Claude that I heard talking about that. I think on Reef Bum, he was mentioning um, you know, a lot of trace elements get in from our, our foods, even our dry foods. And if you look, you'll see a breakdown of what's in there. Yeah. And uh, I actually was kind of trying to trace down where I was getting this high manganese in my system. This is a manganese, while back. Okay. And uh, and it's interesting because manganese is low for some people. It's just one of those ones that for me is often elevated. And I looked mm-hmm. at the food, the pellets that I was feeding, the, it was Vitalis and it was very high in manganese. Yeah, um, see. And, you know, I, it could have been one of the inputs. It's like, it's all about that thing where we've got intentional inputs and non-intentional inputs. Correct, and, yeah. And, you know, you can you can look and, and, you know, I went and researched some of the other foods out there and actually Fauna made a food where when I looked at the breakdown, the manganese wasn't a high element in that food. So I made that switch and um, I think my manganese is, is still a little elevated, but it's not as high, it's not rising like it was before. So, okay. yeah, yeah. I think that's interesting but I think things you're, to keep you're in using... mind. using... Tropic Marin salt, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Tropic Marin salt does have also a bit higher uh, manganese already from yeah. base. Yeah, yeah. And my understanding of manganese is it's an okay element to have elevated. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, I, I see yeah. a lot of, it's always hard to say, oh, this, this element does color this. But you do see a lot more deeper reds with manganese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and again, uh, you, like you were saying with zinc and maybe being one of the main elements responsible for that, you know, metallic shine, that probably also is another thing to do with the balance of the other elements too. Because again, if you, if the zinc is elevated on its own, then that's probably not going to be good. But if you have a good mm-hmm. base level of everything else, then yeah, 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 for sure. Um, actually, funny question, and I I kind of find this like a. I don't know. It's a, almost a bit of a thought experiment, but do you would you agree that color is always an indication of coral health, or would you say that there's some variance in that? Because I believe there's that's not always an indication. Yeah, I would agree with you because I've seen brown acropora which grow extremely well, and I know they can color up really nice, but they were brown with polyps out growing extremely well with in my opinion, shows that the coral is happy, the coral is healthy. Um, color is not always an indicator, yeah. no. Um, I mean, in Germany, we say um, having pastel colored tanks is basically having a porcelain tank because it's so colorful, but if you snip somewhere, everything is going to break. So yeah. that would indicate a very unhealthy tank if it's too colorful. Yeah, um, yeah, because I've seen corals that are colored really well but not really putting out axial growth tips or Mm -hmm. you know where you know maybe some of that color is actually coming from some some of these pigments are being produced as a protective mechanism you Mm -hmm. know whereas you know some of these yeah like some of the corals in my system that grow the fastest are not always at their best color you know because maybe their nutrition needs are being met really well and they just don't really need to put resources into that component of their biology i don't know 
Um, I believe we're heading in the wrong direction right now with uh, going more into the true UV LEDs. I think we're now getting more into risky areas because whenever, uh, especially like newbie acquirers run their radions with 100% UV or near UV, mm -hmm. you can tell that they have issues because a lot of times uh, trace elements aren't there yet because they're not dosing it. And the coral has then issues um, protecting itself from those UVs. And now we're going near true UV. And I think a lot of people are going to burn their corals um, soon when more lights with that come out. So, so you're saying some of the newer lighting models are going to have more of a true UV? Because I know yeah, this I was think... sort of brought up in a few sort of reefing podcast conversations about yes. how the UV that's in radions and some of these lights is not true. Those are not UV because they're yeah. not under 400, but mm. the Stratton Pro has true UVs in it. And I've seen a lot of uh, newer tanks having issues with that. Um, GHL just released two new lights with a lot of LEDs below 400. And I think we're going to have a lot of issues for uh, like us who we have most of it down. I don't think we're going to have major problems, but a lot of acquirers who just bought this lamp mm -hmm. and want to put it over their tanks, run it 100% uh, the dials. They're going to have a lot of issues. Yeah, so. that's interesting. Yeah, because I've been running my UV and um, the yeah the the ultraviolet and the hyper is it hyperviolet? There's the two. I think violet. it's violet and UV. Yeah, violet yeah. and UV. Yeah. So I've Which always are... run those. You know, basically they hit a hundred percent. Yeah, know, me and, too. And me not too. really yeah. too concerned because they don't. You know, but so the, I guess the question is like if they're adding these true UV spectrums to these newer models. Uh, like in nature, uh, there's a lot of those UV spectrums hitting the coral, or are there? Like, it, I don't know how deep, I, I mean, I would assume UV spectrums actually penetrate pretty deep under the ocean, right? I think Than was talking in a podcast about that on a, reading about a paper, and they don't get too deep UVA and UV, um, the UVA it doesn't penetrate that deep. Okay. So I don't think corals get hit by it that hard. I mean, of course, when there is like some Acropora do when there's no, uh, when they're um, on low tide. Yeah. But it's always, I don't like to compare what we do as a quest with the ocean because basically it has nothing to do with the ocean, what we're trying to do. We're trying to imitate it, but we have nothing in common. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean ba then... basic things we have in common, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's like there's there's just certain aspects of it that would be so hard for us to replicate. Yeah, I mean, just low tides, acroporas and clams standing mm -hmm. out in low tide for hours, leave an acro out for 20 minutes and it's already like super angry at yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> That's a good point. They're, they're not, yeah, because if you look at those pictures of Fiji, Fiji corals baking in the sun at low tide, yeah. um, and I that's don't like, think what, I could do 1500 that. 1,500 par or something? Like... <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. And I mean, you know, part of the, probably the coral in the wild's protection is it is it has these ideal conditions. So all of yeah. the sort of, you know, enzymes and, and things that create those protective mechanisms for it to be exposed are probably at fairly ideal um, levels, right? Whereas in mm -hmm. our tanks, they just, they're not going to have you know, the same kind of resistance. No, we're, we're yeah. not. We're definitely yeah. not uh, perfect anyhow. Yeah. yeah, actually, I mean, that is that is a funny thought because I'm thinking now about what are the other things, you know, you would probably need a moving light source, you know, a light source that moved across the system. Over I the remember the back <laughs> in the halide days, people had those on running, mm -hmm. like uh, like um, running over the tanks to save I've power. Seen that. Yeah. Um, I think for a while they had that LED that moves too. I can't remember the name of it. It's just a little yeah. silly to look at, but in theory, I mean, you know, that is one thing about our tanks is that coral, the light hits the coral at the same angle all day long. Yeah, I mean, maybe, all day long, maybe yeah. if you have some different bars come on, like they might hit a bit of a different angle. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I still run T5s just like for, for a couple hours. T5s a day. have the just, best uh, spread. Yeah. Yeah, they fill all those nooks and crannies for sure. I guess, and yeah, so another thing would be um, just to stay on this this tra thinking train for a second because it's kind of interesting, but the flow would be another thing. I just don't think we ever yeah. could replicate the ocean. And it's not just the fact that the flow, you know, is it's kind of this pressure that comes in and out. It's also the fact that it's kind of a little water change on a regular basis too. It's yeah, pulling I mean, they... away. 
you always know. fresh water coming in. I mean, flow wise, I think we Europeans are a bit ahead of you in the States. Um, do you remember the ocean motion for your um, in tank, uh, yeah. your inlets that we have that from a lot of companies for our power heads now mm. that are uh, so you can hang your Nero threes and it moves uh, you're in your tank, so you always have a different type of flow, not yeah. a stationary pump anymore. Um, that's becoming more and more uh, popular in Europe. Yeah, I wonder, did you know if they still make sea swirls? Because that was a product about... Yeah, yeah no, I don't you know. know if they still make them. I think they, I they were prone to failure. Like, they weren't, yeah. you know, people would buy them, and they were pretty expensive. Um, but basically, if anybody doesn't know, they're like, they were like a box that kind of sits on your Euro brace or top of your tank, and your return goes through it, and it just slowly turns side to side, I think on 90 degrees or 45 degrees. Somewhat, like yeah, something like but that. They, yeah. they they were cool. I mean, you know, but you're right. I mean, I think the more you can randomize, the better. And uh, yeah, like something with an actual mechanical movement <laughs> would be yeah. would be would be better. Yeah, like I don't think we have a, a ton of access to those products in in. Uh, no, in they're America, really yeah. getting big uh, in in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, especially some of those. Um, some of those wave pumps that are um, you you can't change the direction of them, like um, you know, for example, MP40s like the, or something. Yeah, like that. but MP40s you couldn't really do that with because the yeah, magnetic I mean, side's always on the other side. But something like a Neptune wave, you know, those are like very like yeah. they're a very powerful pump, but they're just like poof, like right down the center, <laughs> like Super they don't. Straight. Yeah, or like, like a Panther Ray, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'd be cool to see more development on on that side of things. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you want to talk about lighting a little bit more? We're kind of sure. kind of down that road anyways. So um, I guess, you know, the big topic recently and a lot of people ask me about is peak photo period. And mm -hmm. so, so what's your kind of feeling? There's two kind of double question here, but um, what is your thoughts on how fast uh, you should get to your peak period and how long the peak period should be? And then I guess I'll also add, what do you think is the maximum photo period you should have in a day? So how I do it, um, I have about an hour ramp time from start uh, to peak. Um, okay. So it goes up pretty fast. Um, it stays in peak, which is daylight, so super bright daylight. That's how I run it um, for four hours. And then it goes slowly down into a full blue for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. which is basically 11 hours the whole day. Okay. Yeah, and uh, this has been a, a discussion. I You probably heard about the bolus method that's kind of... kind of. Yeah, not really. We slightly heard a little bit of it. Yeah. But I don't have... I'm not super in-depth. Yeah, I mean, it. I'll get a, a guest on or, or Claude or maybe... Yeah, maybe both uh, Doug and Claude to talk about it. But, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the idea is to dose your entire alkalinity dose for the day. Yeah, but yeah, This yeah. is mm -hmm. sodium bicarbonate, not... Bicarbonate, not because it wouldn't work with... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't do that. But you dose pretty much the whole dose that your tank needs mm -hmm. for the day in the way that the buffer system and everything processes it. It's sort okay. of, you know, essentially, but one component of that is to time that bolus dose with the peak photo period coming up really quickly. Mm -hmm. So what's your kind of thinking on getting the photo period up quickly? Um, and, you know, maybe that could be something you could compare to nature too, right? How quickly do they get it up? In the bolus system, I think it's like within half an hour to an hour. You're at your full peak. Yeah. Okay. I so mean, an hour. Similar that's where to you. I yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been always. Uh, I like to have it like fast um, up, and I com uh, use um, usually a combination when um, when the it starts to peak. I dose my aminos, my vitamins, um, my other coral foods. So right when the coral is like super in growth mode. It has all of these um, fast um, uptake yeah. Um, foods, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would, I would say that it makes sense. Yeah, the, I mean that's similar in the in the along the lines of the bolus dose too, because it's this big, you know, all of the trace elements that are coming along with that alkalinity, which I think are going to be some of your. I think it's like uh, potassium, iodine, iodine, bromide, a little bit yeah. of potassium. I think that's what may, mostly in trace yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, you know, and those are uh, pretty significant components to growth as well. So that would make sense. You and know. they help against like light stress as well. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have that much light, 
then you need something like iodine to protect your coral against uh, light stress. So yeah. it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and then um, to compare back to nature for a second, because now we've, we've, we're talking about this, but uh, I mean, the sun does rise pretty fast in you tropical have like a, regions. Yeah. yeah, like I mean, even though the sun might be low on the horizon, you know, within about a half an hour to an hour, a reef would seem fairly bright on a clear sunny yeah. day. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that would be applicable to nature too. Um, yeah. 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 Um, maximum par, you know, what, what have you kind of seen for, I've, you know, I'm, I'm not too much into like a par wars. I don't go too crazy, but some millipora do get up to 700, mm -hmm. uh, when I, when it's full daylight. Yeah. So that would be like the maximum you would hit your yeah. SPS with. Yeah. Um, and then sort of your average, what would you say for most SPS? Like, what do you kind of, I don't care about numbers end, that much either. But. Yeah, <laughs> but it's 250 to 350, the typical, um, yeah. range, but I've seen acros that are fine in the hundred parish. Yeah. So, but some of the more like acropora, millipora, uh, aprantuides, the ones that get a lot of light, I try yeah. to give them a lot of light as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, we talked about, um, we've gotten through the acros on my coral series with Chris Meckley, but there's a few I mean, acros that we mentioned that you're like, you can kind of put this one anywhere and it's going to kind of look yeah. the same. <laughs> I think you uh, mentioned the Austera and I agree with that. You can yeah. keep that on the bench of your window and it still would be happy. Yeah, yeah, still be the right color. Totally. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't get too obsessed with the, the par game and I, um, I, I want to have a guest actually on to talk a little bit more about par um and lighting and it should be interesting because i think he has a test for the maximum the amount of light that a coral takes in over the course of a day versus i was about to say that because yeah. there's a difference if you're talking about 12 hours of 350 par mm -hmm. or six hours 600 parts it's basically the same amount of light just um in a few hours yeah. so it's very hard for a newer aquarist to understand those principles that it basically um it, we have to talk about the amount of light that it's getting yeah. over the course of the day not just um a single static number um and i think acropora can only take in for six hours photosynthesis any, anyway yeah i heard so, it was four hours so or four hours yeah. I, yeah. I know it was some somewhere in in that area um so everything else is just wasted energy but still we need somewhat of it yeah and i i kind of you know my theory has always been that maybe past that photosynthetic period um that's maybe when more of the coloration of the coral happens yeah you because know. you're stressing out the zozanthelia yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and then uh i guess uh, zozanthelia is actually classified as symbiodinacea i think that's the new proper term for it yeah so. but we think of it as being this one culture of of um symbiodinacea that's on the coral but it's actually a mix of different types yeah. so maybe I some of like them four clads a b c d something like yeah. that. yeah but i'm my assumption is maybe that some of them are um you know better at regulating like photosynthesis is not going to be the same for all of them so you know, yeah you definitely know. some of them are more for growth some of them are more for um taking up um just nutrients are very different in what they do and that's why um you see a field of bleached corals in nature and just a few f corals that aren't they mm -hmm. have they had a different um amount of those um clads than the other bleached ones yeah yeah that's interesting yeah see, we'll see kind of how some of the research some of the uh you know uh people that are working in this industry in 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 uh testing situations to see what they can put back into nature to maybe repopulate some of these things. um dr nietzsche he's one of the leading um professors in that in or doctors in in germany who does mm -hmm. that he explained to me that they take in um the uh, correct zoosanthelli in the first year of development so if you breed them in higher temperatures they take in the zoosanthelli that helps them work with higher temperatures mm -hmm. but after the first year it's very hard for them to switch around again mm -hmm. so if you already breed them in the right condition for nature it makes it much much easier for them to be um repopulated I back see. out yeah they're more open yeah yeah Interesting. Well, he'd be an interesting person to talk to for sure. <laughs> I can try to get you connected. He's yeah. uh, um, 
he just uh, showed at the interzoo um uh his Acropora that he has sexually reproduced. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hybrid between a tenuis and a echinata. It's oh, super, wild! <laughs> super interesting uh, Acropora. Never, yeah. um, and it's a true tenuis, so it's from Fiji. Yeah. Um, he showed a few Austeras that he's been growing. Um, they've, I think, they're like six months old, and you already can see like how big they are for six months. Um, and I think he's working now on trying to get it into uh, commercial. Um, size for other companies. Cool. Um, I'll, yeah, he's yeah. a very interesting. Guy. Sounds interesting. Actually, that just made me think of when you said Echinata and Tenuous, it made me think of uh, Acropora striata. It actually, to me, it looks a little bit like a cross between those species. Yeah, but, yeah it's very yeah, similar. Like the vivid too, yeah. insanity is the is the striata. Yeah, that's a that's a cool coral for sure, which we don't see very much. No, yeah. we don't actually. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to guess because you have this affiliation with Nios and like, is the farm using a lot of Nios products? Like are you using their yes. salt? Predominantly, yes. Um, the whole farm and like the whole store is just using um, the Nios salt. We produce it in house. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, until I think around two years ago, Nios was still in the same building as uh, as ours. But now we moved it out um, because we just needed more space. But the salt production is still in house. Um, I'm. I, I can't say anything negative about the salt. It's, yeah. I'm very very happy with it yeah um we stick true to what the name is it's a very pure salt um every salt batch is uh icp tested third party so we can't fake any numbers it's just a yeah high-end german salt yeah that's that's good good to know yeah and I, I mean there's like it seems like the german companies are making some of the better salts on the market for the most part so yes you know, i mean you're in a competitive market tropic some... marin fauna marin we have very very good salt in, yeah. in germany that's true yeah and not to get you to i guess i mean have maybe compare but uh looking at some of the data on different salt mixes like i guess you know part of the development is figuring out how to get those, you know, trace elements and all all of those, you know, yeah. elements to kind of like when everything's mixed to actually end up being like a true, you know, representation of what you want it to be. But it's like you say, it's still always going to be a little different, right? Yeah. I mean, every salt that you buy, each single ingredient has a downside. Um, so sodium sulfate, I just found out we were looking at sodium sulfates. Um, has a huge um, uh, zinc uh, attached to it. So mm. you need to find the, find the right producer of that that doesn't have that issue with zinc. And e uh, each ingredient has that issue. So what we did was we got the purest that we could afford because, I mean, you can make salt unaffordable if you want, but you have mm. to make it somehow affordable for uh, reefers. But um, right now, we're still missing a few of the tiniest um, trace elements like copper, um, zinc is not in, in the salt because it's just so hard to mix it in yeah. in the right amount. Because if you get it as a contamination of a different salt, it's easy. Then it's already in there, but mm -hmm. it's not consistent because then you have one batch with five and one with ten because it's not always the same amount of co contamination. So we went the route to have as clean as possible. So we're missing those right now. Um, but we found a way to mix them in and we'll have more info than that pretty soon. It's going yeah. to be, I think it's going to be pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I see a lot of weird things. Um, I mean, you see salts with huge amounts of um, manganese on the market. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of the American salts um, have very high lithium for some reason. I yeah. don't quite understand why that is Maybe the case. Maybe it's just so, around in the sort of industrial processes more, I don't know. Could I mean, be. It's just yeah. it's just weird sometimes. Um, but um, I do a lot of MS testing of different salts just to see how everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And we have good salts on the market. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 I guess like looking back, I wonder what. Um, you know, if you ICP'd uh, Instant Ocean from 20 years ago, what would that look Oof, like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that's evolved in the hobby that's, I think, made it easier to be successful as a new hobbyist now. It's just more reliable 
quality of product. But I still wish a lot of the salt manufacturers would be more transparent about their mm-hmm. salts. I mean, um, what we do, each and every bucket has even the alkalinity on the bucket itself, the mm-hmm. calcium, magnesium. So, of course, you will always have small deviations between batches so sometimes you could have eight alkalinity and then the next batch eight and a half which is a small amount but still um i've seen other salts with eight to eleven which is huge numbers and if you would have that more transparent i think everybody as a uh, consumer would be more happy about that yeah so yeah that's a pretty big range of difference for sure i mean yeah, I, I don't really understand why any salt would want to shoot for these higher numbers. I never really understood the Me whole neither. black bucket Red Sea thing. But yeah, Red Sea does actually give you a code to look up um, the the salt online. But uh, mm-hmm. but it yeah, doesn't give Red you the sea trace. Does it right now, yeah. doesn't really give you the trace elements. It's just major elements. So you get potassium and I think you might get iodine too. But, you know, I don't think you get into the actual minor trace. So. Yeah, that's cool. So, do do you guys provide the full ICP of what's in the salt in per batch? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah, everything. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's good to know. Right yeah. now, uh, we use Triton, and he updated his machine, so we have fluoride now in it as well. Like showing, of course, it was in beforehand, but now Triton shows it as well. Um, yeah. 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 And fluoride's an element I've been paying a lot more attention to lately. Have Did you notice it was pretty low on some of your systems and, and adjust it from there? Or how was it kind of sitting for you? I know since we have a good baseline with salt, I mean, that is a big concern from some salts that have low um, fluoride because it's not measured. So mm-hmm. why would you put it in if it's not measured? But um since we have a good baseline and I'm already adding it to the trace uh, element solution, I never mm-hmm. had huge problems with it. Yeah. But it, it gets depleted fast. So, yeah, yeah, definitely it's getting used for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that it has not, it's been a bit of an overlooked element now that I know how much of a difference it can make for uh, certain blue coloration and, and overall health, I think. And especially for, for North Americans who run so much kalkwasser, kalkwasser, when it uh, hits the water, it precipitates a little bit and it always binds a little bit of fluoride. I mean, it's used in, mm-hmm. in um, water uh, cleaning plants for that to bind fluoride. Um, so a lot of Americans running kalkwasser are running super low fluoride bec- and they don't know because nobody's measuring it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point that you know that's a good proof that it does uh, precipitate and bind some of those fluorides yeah. if it's actually used in an industrial um, c- scenarios <laughs> to pull yeah. it out yeah so if anybody doubted it then there you go yeah yeah but uh yeah so let's see here what else about salt um oh yeah i meant to ask you water changes um mm-hmm. and at the farm like do you have a strict kind of water change protocol yeah. amount i'm volume? super basic um 10% weekly, every sing, uh, every system in the whole store, everything, yeah. 10% weekly. Um, I, I you say the bucket is the best filter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's an easy, but it's it's a reset. It's like, yeah. I, mean, I don't like big changes because yeah. I've always seen negative effects from big water changes. Not like with just our salt, but in general, I've always seen um, and... I've read an article not too long ago who did um, aquabiomics tests after big water changes, and it changed dramatically after a big mm-hmm. water change, which indicates that it's not good for your tank to do yeah. big water changes. I think I agree. Like I had been doing approximately 20 gallons on my systems, and I think I'm going to do... I, the last couple I've done have been 10%, and I think I'd rather do the 10% more often than the bigger one less often you know my thinking was that uh you know if you're doing smaller ones more often then you're sort of changing some of that water that you already changed but um i think they did the math of that on brs or something and it's actually kind of it's such a negligible amount of it that doesn't really matter so yeah and i like love to use it just to siphon out to try this and get everything clean i don't do it just mainly for the water change but to get small detritus pockets out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, and the next question was to do with uh, what are your sort of thoughts on filter rollers and filter socks and, you know, things to mechanically remove some of that 
detritus. I'm on the fence. Mm -hmm. I'm really on the fence. Um, when I don't use them, I don't have any on my systems. Um, I just have them on the um, invert systems. Um, I just use a little bit of filter floss. Whenever I use filter rollers, I see a little bit less polyp extension on Aquapora. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always tend to not use them on heavy Aquapora tanks. Yeah. Do you think that maybe they're pulling out some of the sort of bioavailable planktons and things that maybe yeah, the I, I, are getting? Yeah, that is what I would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And maybe for like a... It, is it bad know. for the Aquapora? Like, they're still happy, but I just, I like big puffy uh, yeah apples. yeah so maybe you know if you're doing filter rollers and you're removing a lot of that stuff you may have to feed more as a result and it's kind of True. you know a little bit almost redundant in a way yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then what about uv what are your thoughts on running uv not a fan lately um since i said we had those bacteria issues in the tanks as well and you would think that running uv made it better but whenever I saw an improvement and I turned the UVs on, it got worse again. Hmm. So something the UV is killing is helping the corals fight off other pathogens, hmm. I would say. So I have used to be a high, big fan of them, but as of lately, not too much anymore. Yeah, I think I would agree. I mean, I think they're good as a tool for some specific problems you know With obviously fish, and... fish parasites yeah. um maybe dinoflagellites there's certain types that seem to be sensitive yeah. to them but um yeah i mean even if these probiotic good bi bacterias that you want the coral to get that maybe helps it fight i mean it still needs to you know there's a certain amount that's in the microbiome of the coral's tissue in the first place but also yeah. some of that bacteria needs to get to that coral somehow so if it's just getting mm -hmm. zapped in the water column from the uv then you know potentially you're not allowing for some of those good trains to strains to be spread from one to another yeah and what i've saw a lot with customers is that they tend to over uv so what then is an issue that um you produce ozone you produce um a toxic form of uh, bromide which is uh, not good for your tank um that's why i don't like to just randomly let people run uv my customers mm -hmm. usually don't run uv mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, also, like, it's another point of failure in any system, too. You've got this True, yeah. glass, um, you know, thin glass light bulb, basically, that's, <laughs> you know... Produces required. a lot of heat as well. Yeah, so, and, and I've seen people not plumb them in properly, because I know you're supposed to set them so that if your return dies, that the UV, if it happens to stay on, it will at least be submersed. It can't be dry, because that's when, if your water yes, comes back on, it, it can crack correct, that bulb, it, right? It overheats, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, and usually I see a lot of people who run it, uh, plummet in their return line, which usually is just too fast. So it doesn't mm -hmm. really have a big effect on pathogens or um, uh, pests for, for fish anyways. Um, and when it pulls water, it should pull it from the tank, not from the sump. So if you have issues with dinoflagellates, I do uh, recommend it. But then I would hang it over the tank and let it suck from water from in the tank and go back into the tank so you have the um dinos right where they yeah, are yeah that's i had the best success with dinos when i put it right into the main system so yeah. it seems to be the way to go yeah totally uh okay well i won't keep you too much longer because i know no, you got so, a, it's fine. a little kiddo <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh okay so well yeah there's a couple little a couple other things i like to get into so um, let's just kind of go over your major parameters for a second, because I just want to see if there's anything, you know, that you would note about any of these, just from your experience with different systems and whatnot. So like alkalinity, what's your kind of sweet spot? I like to have it between eight and eight and a half max. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over that, I usually saw, um, issues, especially when you have lower phosphates, um, you get those burned tips. That's mm -hmm. why I don't like to run it, uh, higher. Um, I'm kind of a oddball in Germany because in Europe, we like to run it a little bit lower, seven to seven and a half. Mm -hmm. So, um, people always ask me why I like to run it uh, higher. I see better growth over eight. Um, calcium, nothing crazy, 420 to 450 max. Yeah. 
um, mag anywhere between 1250 and 1350. Yeah, you don't go um, up into the 1450. Never of, no. saw no. any benefits. I tried it yeah. a few times. I tried it when we had Bryopsis too to see if that helps. Um, I never saw any benefits. Um, I just saw more precipitation when I went up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I like the it was a someone in Australia was talking about this. I think it was like the ratio of calcium to magnesium. A good way to do it is I think it's something like 3.2 times your calcium mm -hmm. or 3.1. It's something like that 3.1 or yeah. 3.2. So if you may, multiply that, then that should be you know, kind of like the right ionic balance between your calcium and magnesium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So no benefit, but you probably have known, noticed things are not good if it's say below 1200 or 1150 or something. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, it, it does help to um, keep, uh, I think Lou did a great uh, talk about it, how it provides um, a balance to alkalinity and calcium. So you need mm -hmm. to have it or you can't get the other ones right. Yeah. Um, so I think it's always important to keep it over 1250. I don't yeah. like to go under 1250. Uh, yeah, it kind of stabilizes the calcium, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Potassium and iodine, I guess, go through that. Potassium, those. nothing crazy. I don't like to get it under 400, but yeah. I don't like to go high as well. So I have a very tight range there, 400 to 420. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people run up to 500. Whenever I did that, I've seen like um, RTN. Yeah. So I never. I think if it got there really slowly, you know, it might be Maybe, okay. Yeah. But then it's like you go and add a coral from another system. Like, how well are things going to adapt, right? Like, it might be... Yeah, you know, no, that's why I is. never dabbled into um, those bigger elements to play with those. Just have a tight range. Yeah. Um, iodine, 50 to 70. Yeah. Um, I like to keep it there. Have you noticed blah, 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 any blah. issues? Kind of where do you start seeing issues in corals darkening up? I know if it gets too high, they can start to brown out not, apparently but not instantly mm -hmm. um i had that i overdosed in one of our show tanks um i had like 120 but mm -hmm. my um aquapora um strawberry shortcake was still perfectly colored it has to do with uh phosphate in my opinion if you have high iodine and high phosphate there's not a big issue with uh, with darkening but as soon as you have low phosphate which most people have and then um go up with high phosphate instantly i see brown corals hmm. yeah interesting yeah so that's one of those balances again i guess yeah yeah totally okay so on the nutrient side of things i'm sure you run systems at different uh ranges but not maybe really. whether intentionally never, not, or not too much yeah yeah no no not too much of course uh, i always have issues running my sps system getting nutrients in um but i try to keep everything between five and ten nitrates Mm -hmm. I don't see any issues go, uh, um, benefits going lower or higher. I would agree. Um, yeah. And phosphates bet uh, below 0 0.1. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe rock bottom, would you say, don't go lower than 0 0.03, 0 0.02? Yeah, that that's super low. I, For me, I don't go lower than 0 0.04. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of great success uh, if I had for a while. Uh, 0 0.15 i still had perfectly colored aquapora yeah so, yeah it, numbers and nutrients are not that important if you have good amount of light and trace elements yeah i i say it's like a like a table if one leg is cut off the other three are still keeping it the table mm -hmm. steady mm -hmm. Um, of course, if all of them are there, it looks perfect, but, um, <laughs> just nutrients is not super important. I would yeah, say. Yeah. No, I agree. And also like, you know, having elevated numbers that are, you know, you know, detectably above zero is just ensuring that those nutrients are available, yeah. you know, that they're there, you know, so that's why a zero is really bad, but a 0 0.01 phosphate at least is something, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's something, but I already yeah. see issues, a lot of like the die off from the base, um, if it goes that low and 0 0.01, that's just one hiccup and then you're at zero. Yeah, so exactly. I, I mean, I'm not recommending and, and, you know, maybe also there is a saturation point where it's just not that available until it's above 0 0.02 or 0 0.03, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I'm, I mean, I've seen a lot of issues as well when like, 
we talked about amino acids. When I have super low um, phosphate and I start dosing amino acids, I see issues. But if I have it over 0.02, 0.03, that's at least, I never had any issues. But as soon as it goes lower and I start dosing, I see issues instantly. Hmm. That's interesting because I would have almost thought people that are sort of struggling with low nutrients, like that might be a good time to use an amino. Well, you aminos know. are mostly yeah. um, uh, uh, nitrogen sources, so yeah. th there's not a lot of phosphorus That's in true. it. Yeah, so if it's a nitrate, yeah, and I guess I'm thinking more on the nitrate side of things too, but, you know, if your nitrates were really low. If the nitrates are low, that yeah, makes then, sense. Yeah, then it may make sense, but then, like you say, if your phosphates are low and your nitrates were low and you just added amino, then you're actually making that ratio of nitrate to phosphate even worse. Yeah, because the core worse. wants to grow, pulls the aminos, but tries to get some phosphate too, yeah. and there is no phosphate yeah, and instantly there. you get yeah, that Same with sense. bacteria. I mean, uh, bacteria grow pretty fast from aminos and they try to get that phosphate as well. Yeah. Boom, pro problems. Yeah. And I mean, would you say if you think a system is experiencing some bacterial issues with the corals, like maybe aminos are... A Instantly thing? stop it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Everything uh, uh, with organics, I recommend to stop it. Yeah. Um, that's how I started playing with sugars because I found an old paper that... Uh, looked into amino acids and different sugars. Um, they looked at sick corals that had the white band disease. Mm -hmm. um, and they looked at different sugars from uh, uh, if a healthy coral, a sick coral, and the bacteria in the water column. And a few of those sugars were only used up by the healthy coral, not the sick ones mm -hmm. and the uh, water column bacteria. So that's how I actually got into playing with sugars. Yeah, interesting. I wonder, you know, where that will go because, you know, I think about this a lot with some corals where, you know, the coral is almost it effectively seems like it's damaged beyond repair. At it, there's some event or some something happens to it where no matter what you do, even if the rest of the system improved, a coral's just kind of sick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? We've like seen and, that before, yeah. You, yeah, you may have improved, you may have moved way past where that issue was, but um, you know, maybe that's an avenue to look down to potentially, mm -hmm. you know, bringing some of these corals back to health because, yeah, troubleshooting a compromised coral is always a hard yeah. thing be because you, you know, you got to keep in mind what is all doing well. Is this just an indicator? And it was the first one to start showing, um, you know, like the beginning of problems that might the other ones might start having. Or is it just a one off weird thing? You know, yeah. sometimes it's hard to know, right? But I mean, we keep such different animals in our in our aquariums from different yeah. regions in the world, and there's so many factors, right? And you usually don't see that many different corals in one close proximity. I mean, mm -hmm. we have soft corals, uh, LPS, and all different SPS just in one small, yeah, box basically. Yeah, it's kind of insane, really. And again, that's another <laughs> thing you could we could put on that list of things that will never be like the ocean <laughs> in our tanks, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we can try. We have carbon. We have GFO. I mean, we can try. Yeah. All right. Let's do the rapid fire questions. So first one is, I'm going to say, I'm going to actually add a category to this one. So favorite fish and most useful fish. Favorite fish is a Lotilia crassiliosa. That's a super small, rare um, goby that lives with a pistol shrimp from the Red Sea. Nothing special color-wise. It's black. Mm -hmm. um, but just the way it swims, it has a very um, delicate way of swimming. Um, I used to own uh, a pair in, in, in a small system. Uh, that's what, definitely my favorite fish. Um, cool. Favorite utilitarian fish. Mm, I yeah. never was a big fish guy in... I mean, but you must know say, at the farm, like, which, which fish does a job the best. <laughs> um, it's a type of mandarin fish that I really enjoy in the farm. It's um, Cinchuropus ocellatus. It's a, um, yeah, it's like a larger version of a mandarin. It's not mm -hmm. super colorful, but they have a great uh, way of interacting with each other, male and female. And he eats flatworms. Okay. And, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's a job that needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, favorite SPS? Tenuous. Love hate relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Or Befaria. Yeah. Befaria now. <laughs> Kentai yeah. from Australia, yeah. too. Yeah. For sure. 
And, uh, okay, LPS. Um, I don't see as many LPS photos in the photos you sent me here, but uh, you must have some favorites. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, saying Torch would be easy, but I would say I'm a big fan of Scolemia. Mm. And if I would get the chance right now, I would start reproducing them sexually that mm. was my intention that's why i'm trying to connect with uh, dr nietzsche as well more yeah because um yeah i think uh, that would be my next project to probably reproduce be the, some probably be the most money in that too but yeah that was one of the funny things with my conversation with jamie craggs was he he got those scullies to breed yeah he got like the scullies gray, but he was ugly ones, right? or something yeah he's just yeah. like <laughs> Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, Scolies, I've been really, really enjoying um, seeing how fat they can get. When when you get them, same with uh, Acanthostrea, when yeah. they come from the wild, they're skinny. Um, but when you keep them in a tank and feed the tank well, they get so huge. Mm -hmm. And I just love seeing that. Yeah, that's cool. And, and there, I mean, just as far as coloration, it's pretty amazing oh, how many... Insane colors can exist now i've wondered actually because um you know we know that like a lot of the sort of spliced coral thing when it comes to acropora um is these two genotypes settling in the same you know and essentially growing in a, as a colony together but i wonder with these corals like these rainbow scolies master scolies um maybe there's other corals like chalice econophilias that have you know, rainbow coloration. I wonder if mm -hmm. they're a mix of genotypes or if it is an expression of just, you know, some other reason that it's producing these different color st strains. With chalice, I believe so, because the typical rainbow chalice, the red ones with the yellow rim and blue with mm -hmm. the green rim, you can get both of them separately. You can yeah, find those. I agree. And if you're lucky, they grow together. So I'm pretty sure it started out as two separate colonies and just grew together yeah basically. yeah so it's two genotypes yeah but and I think with scolies might be like, different yeah i don't know because if you look at the uh, U, uh, ufo scoli the green one with the black rim and then you look at the bleeding apple ones a master scoli is basically just both of them combined it's a green scoli with a black rim mm -hmm. in the middle and the bleeding apple style so who knows? Yeah, hard to say. That would be expensive research to do, um, to test the genotype. Yeah, but of, I would love you know. <laughs> to, because we get quite a lot of uh, scolies, and I would really love to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, scolies are awesome for sure. Yeah, okay, uh, softy, favorite softy? Um, lit little futon it's like a super skinny long like a cinularia but long okay and they get they, they get like really long and we have a variant in germany it's bright pink so it's a daylight coral you can't keep it in blue light so mm -hmm. you won't see it it's bright pink with yellow tips on the side i have a, um, a, a small colony of that that's my favorite soft coral okay i tried to look it up oh i actually spelt it I, my guess of how it was spelt was actually almost right yeah, so I, I couldn't on. even remember yeah, how yeah. it's written as well, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I actually... And they grow yeah. pretty tall. I think they get yeah. up to like 80 centimeters in, in height. Cool. That's a good answer. Something different. Uh, okay, so next one is... I mean, I probably know the answer to this, but what's your favorite light product or source of light? I'm... <sighs> Radeon G4s. I've been, a, I'm always been a G4 fan. Mm -hmm. um, haven't played too much with the six yet. Wasn't a big fan of the fives. Yeah, I had fives on my personal tank and wasn't happy with the fives. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I've been, it seems like a few people are in that that mindset where the the fours were actually one of the better, the better products. Yeah, interesting. Uh, okay, and this question, maybe, yeah, you, you would be company bias on this one, but I was going to say if you could pick one I'll product. I'll try my best. If you could pick one product line, if you could only use one product line for all of your, your you know, your water chemistry and everything. Well, as I said, we're revamping everything, so it, it wouldn't be fair to just say that mm -hmm. for NIOS, but um, I've even before I worked at Fauna, I was always a big proponent of Fauna products. Yeah. So I would say, uh, without being biased for NIOS, and I love our products, and I think they're going to be great, yeah. I, 
Fauna Marin products are a very um, valid product. Yeah, plan. and I mean, there's a huge amount of them too. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, solutions for things in the hobby. If, for you know, different problems, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, the next question is best salt mix. Um, I mean, we talked about that, so... For that, uh, I'm yeah. true, I'm honest. I would say Nios salt is yeah. the best on the market, but I, I'm not legally allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, I... <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, and yeah, we didn't really talk about any which kind of a controllers you guys use, but uh, what's your favorite sort of aquarium controller? Not too much. I never was a big controller guy. Um, when I had my personal tank, I dabbled a little bit with the GHL stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bit too much headache for me, so I yeah. uh, took it off. Um, Right now, I have the uh, Refactory KH Keeper on one of the farms. It's running decently. Not not super perfect, but it's good enough, I would say, yeah. for an aquarist. Um, and I wanted, because I was in, at the Reef of Palooza in April, I want to play more with the Apex soon. I definitely want to try that out because it, it was interesting to see everything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been using Apexes for years, but it sounds like you've done very well as you being the controller for the most part. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, after, uh, I mean, you know, after a while you just see if something is wrong with your tanks, you just get a good eye for that. Um, but I never was a big fan of relying on uh, controllers to dose anything or yeah. something like that. Yeah, no, no I agree. Totally. Uh, okay, favorite wave pump, if you could kind of weigh out the MP40 versus um, and things like that. How, I, of course, the MP40s are great. I love them. I've been using them for years. But I got to say tons of pumps. Mm. Mm -hmm. Tons of pump. Um, they're just built for life. Um, they fell out of favor in the last few years, but if you find one that's been in your basement for the last ten years and you plug it back in, it's still going to run. Yeah, totally. Uh, um, they're super quiet. Um, I've seen they've been working on controllers for that now. Um, I, I like tons, uh, yeah, tons of pump. I agree. And I like that you can, the way the mounting brackets are on those um, turbo Yeah, you can get the flow everywhere where you them. need it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I haven't, it's not like uh, those Coralias or something. I've heard horror stories about Coralias basically blowing up and crashing a tank. And you know, Oh, no. Yeah, but but these Toonsies, they do just seem to just keep running for years. Like they do. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, they the new one, uh, it, it runs with, I think, 12 watts. So it's super efficient mm -hmm. um, power-wise. And us, as, we have super high uh, electric prices. So something like that is perfect for us. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, okay, what's your most hated pest? We talked about pests a bit, but which one do you most despise? <laughs> which one do I most uh, hate? Was may or maybe mm. is the hardest to eradicate, in your opinion? Mm. The small gamma um, What are the? Uh, it's like a pod, basically. Um, it looks. It's more food for corals. Um, but what happens in farms, they tend to build their nests right at the bases of Acroporas. It's not a pest per se, mm -hmm. but, um, they build their nests and it's really sticky. So flow doesn't get it away. So what happens is that the Acropora dies from the base because that pod builds its base there. Yeah. I think I have seen this. Are they like an amphipod or? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think amphipod is right, yeah. So, yeah, I had those at one point, and they, they're they not like, yeah, they're not necessarily a parasite, but no, it's they're just like a, a type of amphipod, the and they make kind of like a little, like, kind of cocoon almost at the base of the coral. Exactly, and it's a little it, bit slimy, yeah. cocoon with detritus, and in a farm setting where you don't have sand and rocks, they become a problem over time because they nest right around the bases or sometimes inside of aquaporas or um, torches and where, where, whatnot. Yeah. And after a while, it, the coral gets infected with um, brown jelly or whatever because yeah. of that detritus buildup. 
Yeah, no, those are a weird one, but I'm sure probably the interceptor type treatments could. could yeah, that works them, perfectly. But, uh, yeah, for yeah. us as well. As I said, for us, a bit of a problem, um, but they're easy to kill if you just dip everything in yeah. a potassium car. Uh, those are easy to kill. But in a farm setting, they're super annoying. I never had like real big problems with flatworms. Um, I always managed to get them um, eradicated. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like some people, they seem to just totally take over the tank. And, you know, my experience over, you know, the last 20 plus years of reefing in the times that I had them was they never got really bad. And I think that, you know, they can be manageable in a in a system that's healthy and it has yeah. some predation as far as fish and, you know, but uh, but yeah, I've seen them completely decimate tanks before, too. So definitely have seen yeah. that, too. I mean, nudies, uh, Monty nudies are pretty harsh in a running system like a big tank because you can't just break out all of the Montiporos and they're so hard in, in dipping. But um yeah 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 typical they, answer basically. they walk around the tank yeah all right well um okay uh here's an interesting one if you could put in order uh, of importance um lighting flow or water chemistry what would you how would you put that in order of importance <laughs> it's a hard question yeah because it has so many different factors to yeah it. i would say water chemistry keep everything stable because over that if you have everything stable the light isn't that important in my opinion then water flow because if you don't bring fresh water and bring the the used up water out of the corals mm -hmm. um the coral will die um and then lighting with flow a lot of people forget um how hot water can get in between a coral that's why uh, a lot of these temperature issues are not of, because of the water itself mm. but because because of the water inside the coral if there's no flow getting that hot water out of it mm. the coral usually dies huh so there is these there's these kind of localized areas hot of, spots. of hot spots interesting yeah. i yeah. never thought about that but that is a good thing for people to consider for flow yeah and i also i i think the way you put it is perfect in terms of these importance um you know as hard as it is to put them in order of importance but you know if your water chemistry is really good if your flow is is good is like passable to like you know at least decently good um your lighting can be kind of a little bit variable and your corals yeah. will find a way but uh but yeah totally no that's i think that's a good way to, to put it for sure okay so the big question is uh if you had the financial means to do a polo reef style dream tank. <laughs> um, would you do it? Would you do it? And would you or would you do it differently? No, I would not do it, even though I love the tank. But I rather have something like a Jake Adams studio. Mm -hmm. I like to have different biotopes. I would love to have a tank dedicated to fabias, a tank dedicated to mangroves with um, freshwater fish that were grown in salt water. I would love to have different biotopes mm -hmm. and perfect for that type of coral. So no, I wouldn't want a big one big system. I would a buttload of small systems. Yeah, and it could be in a like really beautiful museum type space or something. Yes, right? where like people in a, come in and look yeah. at different tanks, uh, yeah. just right for that type of genome. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a cool answer. I like I like the idea of you know you know, you know I think uh, you know and it sounds like Andrew's pretty open to. Um, you know, having guests over, although I'm sure it gets annoying having people asking, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I mean, that would be a thing for me too, is like, I would feel guilty keeping something like that to myself, you know, I would want, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. and obviously his no, system, his he system's has a on, lot of systems. yeah, and also, I mean, they're all very much in social media and shared yeah. around, so, so people get to, people get to experience and really get inspired by them, so I think, I think it's a great thing for the hobby amazing what he does i have yeah. met him uh in april too mm -hmm. and great guy beautiful systems 
if I ever have the chance, I yeah would definitely yeah, I would, go visit. I would hope to check it out someday too, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Well, um, I'll just leave you with the final question here, um, and you can kind of go anywhere with this. You you were just at Interzoo, and I'm I'm just kind of curious, like, what are you excited about right now? That's kind of on the horizon for the hobby. You know, whether it be a product or, um, you know, some something that's kind of you know, developing. <sighs> I'm more on the gloomy side, to be honest. When the interzoo, I didn't see as a, I mean, I'm a reefer at heart. I mean, I've worked for different companies and been in the industry for 13 years now. And I didn't see any big innovation. Mm -hmm. Um, And it felt basically that everybody's doing everything now. Everybody's, it's like one big soup of the same. (laughs) Yeah. Like everybody's trying to ponder to every type of customer. Um, back when I started, you had companies they they were they had their niche in a niche, but they were doing it perfectly. Mm-hmm. And right now, as I said, everybody's trying to do everything. Um, I would hope that we get more companies doing their thing and doing better and perfect. That's yeah. what I. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, and like we were talking about with that question about if you could use one product line, it's like, you know, there's no brand that makes the best of all of those things. There's True. always one that's still, you know, I still think there's certain things that Zeovit makes that oh, they make the best great of that song. thing. Yeah. And it it's the most mysterious one too, but it's, you know, one of the best ones. I mean, there's some great products they make. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So on the industry side, I see that point maybe on the biology side, coral side, like anything you're excited yeah, about. Yeah, I'm that. really hoping that we get more of the um, connection between science into the industry because I've seen a big disconnect there. I mean, if you Google a lot of um, papers, you find very, very interesting stuff that can be applied to aquariums, but mm. you don't you don't find that from companies here. So I, I really hope that we get more of the science and industry connection. Mm-hmm. Um, Salem is very, from Reef Builders is trying to do that very big. Um, I'm trying to connect with Dr. Nietzsche because he's doing more, trying to bring his, what he found out more into um, the commercial side. So I think that's where I'm hopeful to, yeah. to be. Um, as, as I said, with product lines, it's very hard to reinvent the wheel now with mm-hmm. um, the whole traces. We know most of it. Um, now we're just getting better and better in finding and and making good trace element mixes. Yeah. But we're not finding out new hidden gems. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We might start to understand what some of the trace elements are responsible yeah. for, but it's still... Yeah, it's still tricky. But no, I think I know what you're saying. And it's cool that um, maybe some of the science community is starting to maybe respect the aquarium hobbyist yeah. community and, and our, you know, um, you know, anecdotal uh, experience because it does have value, too. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Cool. I mean, with the, we were talking about the paper with the Aquapora flatworms. Mm-hmm. Everything that was written in that paper we as aquarists already knew. We knew about how long it takes. We knew what that peppermint shrimp eat the eggs. We knew that um, six line wrasses eat the flatworms. Yeah. Everything they found, we basically already knew. Yeah. And that's with a lot of things. I mean, um, but having now science back it up is very important. And it's the same with just I'm adding random sugars and seeing if the stuff happens or improves or get worse. And if you have then after a while science looking, okay, hey, they were doing this and this, and it actually does this and this, I mm-hmm. uh, think will bring us all up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. Well, that's a good note to leave on. I didn't want to leave on the gloomy note. So, <laughs> um, but I want to say uh, I really like your inspiration to develop and and research and try stuff. And and I, I can't wait to see what you kind of figure out over the next, you know, few years and and what you can bring to the hobby. So good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, thanks for doing this, and we'll definitely keep chatting as we do. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you making the time. Perfect. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Have a good night, man. Cheers. 
All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode and this conversation with Corey Treadwell, a.k.a. Coralhead. If you want to keep up with what he is up to, you can check out his Instagram. It's just Coralhead underscore. That's on Instagram. If you want to check out White Corals, it is whitecorals.com. And obviously, Nios is easy to find at nios.info and nios.aquatics on Instagram. And as per usual, if you have any suggestions for future guests, uh, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, uh, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high-quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.